button. <clears throat> Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 458, the post-Thanksgiving colonist edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's the 28th of November, Wednesday. Welcome back to the program. Okay, we took last week off. There was just no way uh, that I could entertain my parents here at the condo, do all the things we need to do for Thanksgiving, and uh, do all the things us Puritan colonists do over here in America, and do a show at the same time. So we kind of skipped a week. Sorry about that. A lot of news ha happened, but Gavin and I will talk about that. Gavin, how are you doing? Well, uh, I'm doing very well, Kevin. I'm, I'm still recovering from last week, too, because although it wasn't Thanksgiving, um, my my public media career peaked in the most exciting way imaginable. And um, I hope people won't mind if they find me taking... Well, I just relished it uh, as, a, as an act of God and a gift of God. It, it really hit the jackpot. And, and, and let's talk about what you're talking about. In terms of... You know, notoriety, you are obviously a commentator of Anglican and scripted, and you have much infamy for that. But uh, a and it pagan, doesn't get much better than that. Yeah, a pagan secular news organization called, and their news it's called Newsnight, and that's probably the biggest uh, uh, media thing over there, called and said, Gavin, we need somebody to talk about this uh, thing with gender, God, and well-be. Come on over. And you're like... Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it was something I was on a train I, I, as it happened. I was on my way to London anyway, but God, because God is good and God is efficient. And on my way to London anyway, the phone rang and this woman says, I'm an editor from Newsnight. It's almost worth, you know, uh, you're spoofing me. Surely this is uh, be because Newsnight is the place where where politicians and prime ministers get taken down. That's mm -hmm. it's the prime BBC serious news channel. For, uh, for weekday evenings. And um, this nice lady phoned and said, the Archbishop has said some rather exciting things. Uh, if we were to ask you to come down and, and be on the program tonight, what would you say? Uh, and I said, well, um, this is quite a serious subject and it plays right into feminism, cultural Marxism, and much of the social turbulence we have. It's not just a theological question about God's XX or XY chromosomes. So she said, explain it to me. So I then spent 40 minutes giving her a theological lecture and she was so sweet. She said, this is really exciting. No one's ever talked to me like this before. I, I see, I, I see why it matters. It, it, I got so excited, I nearly missed my stop. I have to go to Crewe. And G.K. Chesterton was supposed to have got to Crewe and said to telegraphed his wife and said, I'm at Crewe, where should I be? <laughs> so <laughs> every time, in fact, it was Market Harbour, but, but everyone thinks it's Crewe. So I nearly missed my stop, which is the place you go down to London. And she said, yep, yeah, uh, come on down. And then I said, I mean, who am I going to be talking against? Because there are, there are you know, some, some people and one would welcome and one wouldn't. Anyway. In the end, the uh, the very substantial woman priest in London, they were going to put me against, withdrew at the last minute, which was a real shame. Um, but nonetheless, it, it gave the opportunity to talk to the widest possible, uh, most interested and best educated group in the country. If, if that matters, well, it's useful about uh, theology, the gospel and um, uh and, and and why the issues we're arguing about at the moment matter, because the Archbishop had effectively said, God is not your father. He he had said it in a, in a, an, well, not at all a nuanced way, actually. Um, mm -hmm. What he'd done is he said he told half the truth, but the truth, the half truth he told doesn't work without the other half of the truth. Well, I don't think anybody argues whether or not uh, God has genitals. I think you know what we what we want to discuss is uh, identification wise. Does God prefer to be identified uh, as male or female? Does he prefer to be identified as a father? Does you know what are the preferences? And certainly in Scripture, Jesus said, "If you see me, you're seeing the Father. Um, if you know me, you know the Father." And there's kind of a tendency with a, a, a smooth educated uh, reading of the Bible that the Godhead is male in gender. If I, 
if if I may, without causing you to miss your train, <laughs> I'd That's like right. to offer. A... <laughs> Go for I it. Think two, I, well, I think there are two very important um, theological, philosophical um, points at this stage, which which we we all ought to have on board if we're discussing gender at all. And of course, our society is now completely fixated with gender and transgenderism. So we need to be able to make an account for our faith a little bit. I think the first thing is that that uh, C.S. Lewis's main point was um, the one that you've made. God prefers to be called father. But he said, if you don't call God father, what happens? We only have two alternatives uh, linguistically. One is you call him mother. And then Lewis made the point that the kind of God who is mother is very different from the kind of God who is father. More importantly, in the Old Testament, um, the motherhood of God is actually humanity's default position, partly because of the way we project from women appearing to be the more fertile and right. produce life. And the real problem in the Old Testament was to get the children of Israel to move away from trying to placate the earth and nature and fertility and, and vague life force and worship the father the, who made the earth and fertility and vague life force. Now, so some people said, well, to do that, he needed to call himself male and masculine and father. Um, of course, actually, he, he to begin with, he's Yahweh, which is beyond it all. He becomes father as Jesus gets closer. But, but if we don't use mother, uh, if we do use mother, we, the danger is we slip into the modern equivalent of fertility religion, which is basically ecology. It's kind of Gaia. So you have to choose between, between the father or, or Gaia, she, or Buddhism, because when you start calling God it and depriving God of personhood and therefore taking away the sanctity of our personhood, you're as close to Buddhism as you need to be. So in one sense, um, calling God father saves you from, from Gaia and Buddha. But mm -hmm. more importantly or as importantly, we've fallen for a, an atheist three-card trick that got played on us about 130 years ago by a guy called Feuerbach. And what Feuerbach did was he introduced this notion of projection. And he said, really, the only reason you guys talk about God as father, God as all-powerful, God as this, you know, this big white bearded chap in the sky is you're all very insecure and you're longing for a kind of daddy, granddaddy figure who will make you feel safe. So you project out of your insecurity from your experience of God onto the sky. Now, the reason that matters is because that's exactly what Justin Welby was talking about. Okay. He was saying, some of you have had bad experiences of, of fatherhood or masculinity, so you don't need to worry about God and calling God male. He was jumping straight into the hole that Feuerbach dug for him. And, and, and you know, that's simply wrong. What is right? Well, well, what is right is to turn the telescope the other way around. There is an act of projection, but it's a creative act of projection and character from God onto us. So uh, is God male? Well, in one sense, no. But does our masculinity or does maleness or more importantly, does fatherhood derive from an aspect of God that's central to who he is? Absolutely. So when there are bad fathers, bad men, bad gender expression, this doesn't mean you don't have access to God as your loving prodigal father who comes running after you in awesome majesty to welcome you home. It means God mends it by reading the Bible, by getting to know Jesus. You mend the broken gender experience. And that was something Justin Welby ought to have been able to explain to his audience, but actually he, he chose to look through the telescope the other way around. And more importantly, um, more importantly, he's buying into the whole secular package. So recently he wrote a forward to a book on transgenderism for use in church schools and basically said, you know, if if you are transgendered or you don't know what your gender is, you know, that's fine. What a wonderful adventure. But actually, transgenderism is not a wonderful adventure. It's a really serious mental illness. And, and to some extent, it's dysphoria. It's a repudiation of the categories that God bestows on us to make ourselves present before him. So, um, one of the reasons why this matters is because our Archbishop is teaching a very heavily secularized, diminished form of the faith. And, you know, that's bad in principle and it will have bad effects. It does. I mean, whenever there's an identification of God, uh, it's taken to its ultimate. When he's identified as king, he's the ultimate king. When he's identified as a man, he's the ultimate man or the ultimate father. 
Um, and if you want to reverse the telescope, as you say, as Justin did, it's not about us and our identity. It's about him and his identity. Him, yeah, sorry. Okay, so I would, it's about I would God say just be, and God's identity. <laughs> so I, I would, I would say to be to be pedantic for a good reason. Um, yeah. He's not the ultimate king, but our monarchs are diminished majesty figures. Right. In other words, um, he's not an expansion from them. They are a contraction and a derivation from him. So is there any excuse for having a king? Well, only in that awe and majesty and power and responsibility derive from God. And if they are exercised on his behalf, then there is some legitimacy for them. Now, a Republican won't find that any easier to swallow than a feminist finds the idea that God That's is right. her father. But nonetheless, they, they both derive from our experience of God in Scripture. They do. Um, let's give a quick update. Our last episode, we talked about Asia Bibi not being accepted into uh, Britain uh, for asylum. She has been accepted into Australia. Uh, now, I don't know if she's there now, what the travel's going on like that. But it was, a, it was interesting to watch uh, all these countries who have a large Islamic Muslim uh, infestation, no, uh, population, you know, say we can't take a persecuted Christian because it would offend everybody. And Lord knows we don't want to offend everybody in order to save one person. <laughs> And I saw that this may all go all the way to uh, Theresa May. You're exactly right. We, we, since you and I spoke, we made two discoveries. Uh, one is that it was the um, it was the consulate staff in Lahore who contacted the Foreign Office saying, "We're in deep trouble if you offer Asia BP uh, asylum." Um, but it went right up to the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister decided she didn't want to lose any votes, provoke any hostility. Well, this is really very serious. A number of commentators said that this is the first time that English foreign policy has been affected by kowtowing to Islam. And, mm -hmm. you know, many of us will find that really horrifying. Uh, so it's wonderful she's been given uh, asylum in Australia and all credit mm -hmm. to Australians. But for those of us who are trying to struggle to keep the precepts of Judeo-Christian culture alive, the fact that our Prime Minister, who is the daughter of a clergyman, could could take this point of view is really hugely demoralizing. And if you're inclined to be pessimistic about the way our culture is going in England, it would be give you extra reasons for being sad. Well, I don't know how pessimistic I am. For me, it's just, you know, deja vu all over again. Here in America, we just celebrated Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving was brought to you by the Church of England. Uh, okay. <laughs> because a group of people who were persecuted by the Church of England decided to get on a boat a long time ago. This is before cruise ships. Uh, sailing over, find themselves here on the shores of uh, what they thought was, you know, obviously India. Uh, it was America. And uh, had a great harvest in 1621 decided to uh, share that harvest with a local Indian tribe. Now, this is before westernization, before colonialization. This is before all the evils of, uh, of the West, as my, my college daughter would tell you uh, how evil Thanksgiving is. Uh, this is actually mankind, humankind at its finest, sharing the harvest. Uh, kind of a, a Eucharist on the shores here. And... So I, I see a deja vu in the fact that, you know, the Church of England doesn't stick up for Asia Bibi. Uh, the uh, church state known as England doesn't stick up for Asia Bibi. Um, so I, she's a persecuted Christian. She, of course, she's going to have to go somewhere else. There were a lot of people on Twitter and on Facebook, a lot of people on the social media were making an enormous amount of energetic fuss. I guess that raises the question of the extent to which social media has any political traction at all. The fact is, sometimes it does, and that's brilliant. A lot of the time it doesn't at all. It certainly acts as an outlet. Um, but there were a great many people hugely exercised, including some very serious journalists who took to the airwaves to say we must offer protection to a persecuted Christian. Well, it was wonderful we had their voices, but it didn't have the political traction we wanted it to have. So um, we don't know what the future is, but, but this is an issue that's going to reoccur 
Uh, time and time I, again. Do, I know the future. I can see into the future. Here's the future within five years. Some person who's uh, radical, moderate, Islamic in their faith is going to be persecuted somewhere, uh, flees, and England is going to offer them sanctuary. Kevin, we've and, done that already. There's, there's boy, a very no. long list. <laughs> There's a very long list of jihadis. All right. That we've no, we 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 have taken. There's a big argument about uh, about jihadis who return, people who've mm -hmm. been fighting uh, uh, against Westerners and killing their troops. And so far, uh, they have been returning. And so, you know, it is it is utterly ludicrous that we can take trained Islamic. Uh, I don't like using the word terrorists because I think it it misnames them. It does. But yeah. Trained Islam. Trained Islamic activists uh, who see violence as the right way of of establishing Islam's claim to other cultures, we take them in, and we don't take in persecuted Christians. We're in a very serious position. I mean, I've been saying it for a long time. I, it's, it's it's boring to go on saying it, but but it's really serious. And wouldn't it be wonderful if the bishops in the Church of England or Anglican bishops and Catholic bishops stood up and said, uh, our culture and the freedom and the values, the God-given, the Christian-given values of our culture are in very serious danger. And we need to energize the, uh, the, the believing Christians in this country to hold politicians to account. The thing is, the Muslims will all vote one way. We can't get the Christians... Christian disunity has always been the gate that has allowed Islam into culture, whether it's been, um, uh, well, I mean, at every point when Islam has advanced on Christendom, Christian disunity has opened the door. Did we do a follow-up yet to the Islamic uh, prayer that was offered at Mass? I don't think so. Uh, last week or the week before, you and I, no, two weeks ago we talked about uh, a person was invited to what cathedral was that? Derby? So it was Blackburn Cathedral, and it was Blackburn a concert yep. of of the Armed Man by a, a composer called Carl Jenkins. And okay. the second movement has the option of having um, an imam do the call to prayer. This was because there are some good reasons for this. Carl Jenkins wrote this after Kosovo. There was an Islamic element in the in, in the Balkan conflict, of course. And he saw this as a piece of art which drew together Sanskrit, Judaism, the Psalms, Christianity, Islam. And as an artist, he puts them all together. But but it was kind of on the, 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 the basis that's driven educational theory in our schools for the last 50 years. The, 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 the blindfolded people in a room with an elephant, you know, they all grab one end of the elephant and somebody says, I have something, you know, looks like a tusk. And somebody else says, I have a leg. And then lo and behold goes the educational theory. You need to put all their experiences relativistically together and you have an elephant. Now, the problem is, whilst there are some circumstances in which that's true, it really isn't true in the arena of, Jude of Christian Muslim relations, where Jesus says, I am the son of God, come to redeem humanity to die on the cross and rise again. And, his, and Muhammad says, my angels tell me you're a fraud. That's right. Now, in those circumstances, you have to choose to one and the other. And one of the things this event did was to give some of us uh, a platform to make a commentary to try and move beyond the elephant in the room um, map that many people have in their head and to educate them about what the Quran really says. Because they, they don't know that the Quran dismisses Jesus and his death and resurrection as fraudulent. So in one sense, this gave us the opportunity to say so. The Dean of Blackburn apologized fulsomely. He he, he did a humble and persuasive apology. The Bishop of Blackburn, who's supposed to be one of our very few Orthodox bishops, said this will never happen again. Um, but in so many cathedrals, the Islamic call to prayer or something like it happens with some regularity. So this is a growing cultural tide. So this was in a setting of a play musical. Not it was a concert. Setting, it was not a concert. in the setting of a Eucharist church service on a Sunday. No, but that raises a question of whether or not a cathedral ever stops being a cathedral. Mm -hmm. I mean, just because you have a, you, just because you play music, do, you know, are you entitled to play? I mean, for example, if if you remember Pussy Riot uh, and their great demonstrations in Moscow, <laughs> they did a video. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> they did a video. <laughs> well, it was it, it was immensely disturbing because it was in, it was intended to be, and it was truly blasphemous. Mm -hmm. The fact that it was a, was music is neither here nor there. It was a, it was blasphemy and intended to be, mm -hmm. actually a call to prayer in a concert or outside a concert. Is a, is a blasphemy to Christians and is intended to be. Uh, one of the things that the Islamic prayers do, the daily prayers, is to ask God to make sure that the Muslims don't go astray like the dreadful Muslim, the dreadful Jews and the dreadful Christians. Mm -hmm. You cannot call someone to Islamic pr prayer without that being part of the package. And the idea it's just a piece of interfaith exotic um, uh, an, an add-on is, 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 a, is a category error. So it was a blasphemy. It shouldn't have happened. Mm. Have you ever heard of this guy, Melvin Tinker? He's a friend of mine. I like him very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, he was going to speak at, oh boy, I have trouble. Was it Derby Cathedral? What, what Dar Cathedral? You'd call it Derby and we'd call Derby. it Darby. Darby. No, Dar it's an E. I've seen it. It has an E <laughs> on there. That's Derby. Don't go. Yeah, you English don't know your English. But okay, Darby Sorry, Cathedral. So and so uh, uh, the CU people said, come on over. Then they the, uh, somebody did a bio check. Went on Wikipedia and Melvin Tinker goes, oh, he actually believes in God. We can't have him speak here. So uh, he was contacted and said, uh, we no longer need your services. Um, Darby Cathedral is known for lots of strange, weird <laughs> things going on. And uh, <laughs> the gospel's not one of them. Give me a little backstory horror, here. Horror films. Well, so Darby. Derby Cathedral, in order to get people through the doors, has been starting a film club, not not even the kind of uh, esoteric sophistication of Blackburn and concerts, but films. And two of the films it decided to show in the last year were one was a horror film and the other one was an erotic film. Mm -hmm. And everyone said, this is terrible. What does the dean think he's doing? And he said in, in the in the in the in the superficial, facile terms that some seen the Anglican clergyman resort to the nonsense that oh this cathedral is here for everybody you know we, we you know we are very profoundly inclusive we just want them to come in and watch erotica uh, above the altar I mean you know it, it's a, it, it it would be unbelievable except it happened well this dean so that the Christian Union the local university had their carol service and they invited Melvin Tilke the dean saw it and he didn't want Melvin now at first sight, it looks like he doesn't want Melvin because Melvin preaches the gospel. But the real story is that Melvin Tinker runs one of the most successful churches in the whole of the northern province uh, of York. Uh, and he doesn't pay all the money the diocese want him to pay because he believes they are being untrue to the gospel. And in particular, uh, he's very critical of York Minster's promotion of LGBT carnivals and processions and spirituality so the real issue i think is not just that he's an orthodox preacher of a very high quality but that they're terrified at the example that he sets of withholding money from the church of england as a sign of his disfavor might be publicized and might spread i think it's about money as well as okay, about well, orthodoxy we're going to find out so they back we're going to find out the truth because Melvin has agreed to be on the program tomorrow. I'm going to record an interview with him in the morning and put that up for sometime in the afternoon or evening for you people in, in England. And we'll find out what really happened. Uh, uh, be nice to, to hear from his voice. Uh, clearly what he thinks happened. So I doubt the bishop. Melvin, is, one, Mel, Melvin is not only an outstanding Christian and mm. priest and vicar. He's all of those things. Mm. Uh, he's also a... a uh, a very competent theologian who's written a great deal. He's just written a book on cultural Marxism. Uh, he and I shared a platform at GAFCON together, and I was happy to be in his shadow and honored to be. And um, he's also one of the leaders in waiting for whatever Anglican orthodoxy emerges from the car crash that Justin Welby is presiding over. So your listeners will enjoy listening to him and meeting him. He's a very good guy indeed. Ah. Good. So that'd be fun. Um, a lot of people are looking here, watching us online, and they see your background. Have you turned the camera <laughs> on? Is this the big theological selection that's inside your your chapel? Um, Kevin, I've, wh I've, had a, I've had an internet meltdown. It turns out that um, 
that the new British Telecom telephone hub uh, sends out a Wi-Fi signal that conflicts with all Apple equipment. And I'm an Apple fanatic. Everything I have is Apple. I like it. It works. I don't approve of all their marketing techniques. No. Sorry they're so big, but nonetheless, I like it. And so I, I suffered from uh, from a Wi-Fi breakdown, and I, I can't even get Wi-Fi in my chapel shed now. So Mrs. Ashenden said, uh, you can come into our best room, the one we keep for Christmas and the tea when the Queen when she comes for tea, you know, that kind of English best room. <laughs> and and uh, as it happens, some of my books are in here. So it, 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 it makes a reasonable backdrop, but, but it's technological meltdown. My father-in-law uh, has told me what the solution is. Sadly, it's not cheap, but at least there is one. I hope to be a back uh, in my in my sanctum um, next time we speak, uh, having good. solved it. I hope. <laughs> well, I, it, you're going to owe your wife so much for this. I just, you know, let you know up front. She's going to say, "Oh, by the way, can you blah 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 blah?" And you have to you have to say yes now. You got to use the okay. inner sanctum. For your recording, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you owe, I'm gonna owe her and Amazon quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Well, this has been a fun program. Let's uh, close out and uh, do it again next week. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 458 of Anglican Unscripted. Tune in tomorrow for Melvin. He's worth it. Mm-hmm.